There are two explanations of attachment in the specification. The first is the learning theory of attachment, which we'll look at in this video, and the second is Bowlby's monotropic theory of attachment. If you're one of my students, you'll need to use handout A07 to fill in as you go along. And if you're not one of my students, you can access handout A07 and the PowerPoint. There's a link in the description below where you can access these. When we're looking at theories of attachment, what we're really asking is, how and why do babies attach to their primary caregiver? Most of the research explains it in terms of how it attaches to the mother, but obviously in this day and age it doesn't necessarily mean the mother. Um, so the learning theory of attachment is from the behaviourist approach, and the behaviourist approach has two main assumptions. The first is that all behaviour is learned through either classical and or operant conditioning, which we'll look at in a moment. And the second assumption is that when we're babies, we are born as a blank slate. So if you look at that um, board on the slide there, it says tabula rasa, which means blank slate in Latin. And it means that as a baby, when you're born, there is absolutely nothing there. You have to learn all behaviour. The behaviourist approach says all behaviour is learned. You are not born with an innate knowledge or um, desire to attach to your primary caregiver or with a personality or a sense of humour or intelligence or anything. The behaviourist approach says babies are born as a blank, blank slate and so therefore if you think about that in terms of the nature-nurture debate, which side of the debate do you think the behaviourist approach is from? Just have a little ponder about that. If you're born as a blank slate, how does a baby acquire all of their behaviours? So hopefully you've identified that it's the nurture side of the debate. It says that it's your surroundings, your environment, your experiences, your upbringing, it's the people around you that shape who you are as a person. So let's look at that in terms of attachment. When we translate the learning theory to attachment, it's saying that we are not attached to our caregiver at birth, but we learn to be attached through either classical and or operant conditioning. So it's saying that when you're born, there is no bond between mother and baby. There is absolutely nothing there for the baby in order to attach to the mother. The only way the baby can attach to the mother is to learn to attach. Now I've mentioned classical and operant conditioning, so we're going to look at what those terms mean and then we're going to apply it to attachment. We'll look at classical conditioning first, and your main researcher for this is someone called Pavlov. There he is there with his nice bushy beard and moustache. So Pavlov accidentally discovered classical conditioning. He didn't set out to study classical conditioning. He was actually just studying the enzymes in the saliva of dogs. And he, if you look at the picture there, that second picture, you can see a dog in a harness. Uh, sorry, dog lovers. The dogs were kept in a harness and he used bowls of food to make them drool so that he could collect the saliva. And he was a bit lazy, I think, because instead of feeding them him himself, he used lab assistants who were wearing white coats. After a short while, Pavlov observed that the dogs drooled at the very sight of his assistants in the white coats. No food bowl was necessary to cause the salivation. And he thought that they must have learned to associate the men in white coats with food. And he called this learning by association. So learning by association is a really important expression when you're talking about classical conditioning. It means that you have learned to associate two things together and have learned a particular response to something that shouldn't necessarily cause a response. Pavlov then conducted what is now known as a very famous experiment involving dogs because he wanted to scientifically test this idea of classical conditioning he wanted to see if he could teach a dog to salivate to the sound of a bell. So before conditioning, he checked that the dog would salivate when it saw food. And of course it did. This is a physiological response. If you see some food, you'll find that your mouth fills with saliva. Then he tested to see whether the dog would salivate to the sound of a bell. So he rang a bell with obviously no food around. And of course the dog did not salivate because a bell should not cause... Uh, a physiological response in a dog to salivate. The next step in the experiment was to begin the teaching process. 
So during conditioning, Pavlov gave the dogs food at the same time as ringing a bell. So every time he fed the dogs, he made sure that a bell was rung at the same time. And he did this many times and he called this process pairing because he paired the food with the bell. And he watched to see if the dog would salivate. And of course the dog did salivate because the food was present during the conditioning process. The final step in his experiment was to see what happened after the conditioning had taken place. So a short while later, he tested the dogs to see if they had learned to salivate when a bell rang. So he didn't have any food present and he rang the bell and the dog salivated. So the dogs had learned to salivate to the sound of a bell. They had learnt by association. They had learnt that when a, dog, when a bell rings, that means that food will suddenly be present. And they actually had the physiological response of responding to the bell with salivation. Pavlov used key terms to describe the classical conditioning process. So before conditioning, an unconditioned stimulus is anything that will cause an unconditioned response. So in everyday life, if you were walking along and someone jumped out and shouted boo really loudly at you, then the shouting is the unconditioned stimulus that will cause an unconditioned response in you to probably scream or jump. In Pavlov's experiment, the unconditioned stimulus was the food and the unconditioned response was salivation. Also before conditioning, we have something called the neutral stimulus. And the neutral stimulus is anything in life that will not cause a response, physiological or otherwise. For example, if the doorbell rings, then you wouldn't suddenly start to salivate. So the neutral stimulus causes no response. In Pavlov's experiment, the neutral stimulus was the bell, and it caused no physiological response before conditioning in the dog. So before conditioning, they rang the bell and the dog had no response. The neutral stimulus is also known as the conditioned stimulus because this is the stimulus that you want to pair with something to cause a response. And I'll explain that further now. During the conditioning process is when the pairing occurs. So you want to compare the unconditioned stimulus with the conditioned stimulus. So if you look at the picture, you can see that Pavlov paired the unconditioned stimulus of the food with the conditioned stimulus of the bell. So he, he did the two things at the same time. The response is still an unconditioned response because the dog will have a physiological unconditioned response to the food because the food is still present. After conditioning has taken place, so after you have paired the unconditioned stimulus with the conditioned stimulus, then you have this final stage where the conditioned stimulus will cause a conditioned response. So this means that something that began as a neutral stimulus will cause a conditioned response in a person or in this case an animal. So the bell, the conditioned stimulus, when it's rung completely alone, then it will cause a conditioned response of salivation in the dog. So we can see that the dog has learned to associate the bell with food and therefore the dog will have the conditioned response of salivating to the conditioned stimulus. So now we need to apply the classical conditioning theory to attachment. So according to this theory, before conditioning, it's the milk that is the unconditioned stimulus and will provide an unconditioned response of happiness in the baby. Before conditioning, the mother is the neutral stimulus. So according to the learning theory, before conditioning, the mother has absolutely no impact on the baby whatsoever. The mother is a neutral stimulus. She means absolutely nothing. So when the baby sees the mother, the baby has no response. Remember that the mother becomes the conditioned stimulus during the pairing process. During the conditioning process, the unconditioned stimulus of the milk is paired with the conditioned stimulus of the mother. And the response is still an unconditioned response because the milk is still present. So the baby has you know, a happy response, it feels comfortable and full, and because the milk is there. But the mother will give the baby the milk, either a bottle or breastfed, um, many, many, many times. And so you're pairing the unconditioned stimulus with the conditioned stimulus, but the response is still unconditioned because the milk is present at this stage. After the conditioning has taken place, then the mother, the conditioned stimulus, causes a conditioned response of happiness or attachment in the baby. So because 
uh, the mother, the conditioned stimulus, has been paired with the milk, the unconditioned stimulus, over many, many times. The baby has learnt to associate the mother with the milk and has learnt to, that the mother causes the happiness. And so according to the learning theory of attachment, that's how attachment occurs. It's nothing to do with a special bond, it's nothing to do with evolution, it's nothing to do with um, survival. It's purely because the, the baby has associated the mother with the milk, or as we would say, the conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. And the attachment is the conditioned response. So the behaviourists believe that all behaviour, including attachment, is learned either through classical and or operant conditioning. And we now know that classical conditioning means learning by association. Operant conditioning means learning by reward. And your main theorist for this is Skinner. There he is on the screen. He's got a nice suit and glasses. And Skinner performed a lot of experiments using animals like rats and pigeons. And so for this particular experiment, he noticed that when he put a rat inside a Skinner box, which is what you can see on the screen, a Skinner box meant that the rat would just be in this box and every now and then it would accidentally hit a lever. When it hit the lever, then food would appear. And Skinner found that because the rats accidentally hit the lever and got rewarded with food, they very quickly learned to press the lever over and over again to keep getting rewarded with the food. And so the behavior that the rats learned was to press the lever. So this is called learning by reward, and the food acted as something called positive reinforcement. So Every t if you get rewarded with something, then you are more likely to repeat that behaviour because you are being positively rewarded to do that. It's quite easy to see positive reinforcement occurring in everyday life. So you think about children having star charts, so every time they brush their teeth they get a star and it means they'll keep repeating that behaviour. If you look at this person on the screen, this is Caroline, who's got quite an unusual dress sense, not something I might wear, but Caroline wears these types of clothes all the time because she is positively reinforced by her boyfriend to wear them. So every time she wears clothes like this, her boyfriend showers her with praise. He's like, oh, Caroline, you look amazing. And he gives her like endless kisses and attention and she's loving it. So the positive reinforcement of the praise and the reward and the attention means that Caroline will repeat repeatedly wear that quite strange dress sense because she's being rewarded to do so. So we need to apply the theory of operant conditioning to attachment. And it's all surrounding something called drive reduction theory. So when a baby is hungry, they are driven to reduce the discomfort of feeling hungry. They really want the milk, so they will cry their head off usually. And when they get the milk, it reduces their drive and also produces a feeling of pleasure. So when a baby has a full tummy, the food is rewarding, and we call this positive reinforcement. So food becomes a primary reinforcer because it supplies the reward. Through classical conditioning, the person who supplies the food is associated with avoiding discomfort and becomes a secondary reinforcer and a source of reward in his or her own right. So operant conditioning explains attachment by saying the child seeks the person who can supply the reward of milk. And it's really important to say that the milk is the primary positive reinforcer and the mother is the secondary reinforcer. The mother is a positive reinforcement, but she is the secondary reinforcer, and so attachment occurs. Next, we need to evaluate the learning theory of attachment. And the first evaluation point is saying, is attachment really learned because of food? Is there nothing else going on? Is there no special bond or comfort or anything between the mother and the baby or whoever looks after the baby? And we can use Harlow's famous monkey study to provide evidence against the learning theory. So this is a criticism. So if you don't know Harley, Harlow's study, um, I've put a link to a good video on it in the description below, but I'll briefly summarise it. Harlow decided to do an experiment using rhesus monkeys, and the monkeys were put into a cage with two fake mothers. So if you look at that picture on the screen, you can see one of the mothers is made of wire, and got a kind of robot face, and the other mother is covered in soft cloth and has a more monkey face. And the only difference that was meant to be there was that the wire mother provided uh, milk, and the soft mother had no milk. 
Now, according to the learning theory of attachment, the monkey should have spent all its time with the wire mother because the wire mother provides the milk. And according to the learning theory, that's how attachment occurs. However, when the monkeys were left in the cage with the two different mothers, Harlow found that the monkey spent up to 22 hours a day with the soft cloth mother because it provided comfort and it would leave one of its little monkey paws on the soft cloth when it was playing with other things. It would run to the soft mother when it was scared, showing that comfort actually was a much more important factor when it comes to attachment rather than food. The little rhesus monkeys only went to the wire mother when they needed food and they didn't like going to her or it. Um, and so that is a criticism of the learning theory of attachment. We don't attach simply for food because of classical and operant conditioning. According to Harlow, we attach for comfort and love. The next evaluation point is that learning theory is largely based on animal studies like Pavlov's dogs and Skinner's rats. And so this is a criticism of the learning theory of attachment because animals obviously aren't as sophisticated as humans. They don't have that sentient uh, they, don't, they are not sentient beings in the same way that humans are, according to some critics. And so, therefore, it's hard to extrapolate the results from animal studies to humans. It means it's a stretch too far and that perhaps humans have developed other mechanisms which would determine attachment rather than simply classical and operant conditioning. Another criticism is that there are ethical issues involved in the original studies that were performed by Pavlov and Skinner. For example, if you look at this picture, you can see that Pavlov has surgically implanted a device into the dog's face to collect the saliva, which was probably done to make it more scientific and make sure that they could measure exactly how much saliva was collected. However, critics argue that this was an unnecessary intrusive um, part of the procedure. And so they would argue that it should not have been done and that that criticizes the original learning theory. A criticism of the operant conditioning part of the learning theory is that operant conditioning is based on drive reduction theory where the baby wants to reduce the discomfort of being hungry. However, drive reduction theory is largely ignored today. If you have a look at this woman, she is certainly not reducing the discomfort that you would feel doing a bungee jump. In fact, you get people who are particularly adrenaline junkies who love to put themselves out of their comfort zone. They are not driven to reduce discomfort, but they actively enjoy causing discomfort in themselves. And so if drive reduction theory is largely ignored today and the whole of operant conditioning is based on that premise, then it questions the validity of whether that um, theory is, is valid or not. A final evaluation would be to use the opposite theory of attachment to the learning theory. And the opposite theory is Bowlby's monotropic theory, which we'll be looking at in the next video or the next lesson if you're my students. Um, and so you can't really use it until you know what Bowlby's monotropic theory is. Um, if you're my students, then you're going to have a short answer test on both uh, the learning theory of attachment and Bowlby's monotropic theory. Um, and you need to complete pages one to seven of handout AO7. Um, on page seven are the two exam style questions, and those are really important. But make notes in the other sections that you've got a good revision material when it comes to revising.